Ladakh is just one part, the least populous part of one Indian state. That state is named Jammu and Kashmir. See, the name Ladakh isn't even included in it. But for almost a thousand years, Ladakh was actually its own country. The same goes for most Indian states. Uh, Ladakh was pretty much its own country, uh, independent or virtually independent for almost a thousand years, a Buddhist kingdom high up in the Himalayas. See, many, many centuries ago, Ladakh had already established itself as a, as a hub of trade. You have Central Asia to the north, you have Kashmir to the west, you have Tibet to the east, and in the middle, you've got Ladakh. And uh, the original peoples, or possibly the original peoples, the Dard people, these people would have mixed and mingled with traders and merchants from all over the place. Well, by the 700s, uh, Ladakh found itself, or would have found itself, sort of sandwiched between a number of great empires and kingdoms. Kingdoms at their zenith, or expansive or aggressive polities. See, to the west you would have had Kashmir. This was the era of Lalit Aditya, the great Hindu king, possibly Kashmir's you know, greatest sovereign ever. To the east you have the Tibetan Empire. This is the, the zenith of the Tibetan Empire, really. One of Asian history's great empires. And even to the north, we could throw in the Chinese Empire, the, the Tang Dynasty Empire, as it is, expands into Central Asia, taking over the oasis towns of the Tarim Basin. And in the middle, you've got Ladakh. Now, of those three, Kashmir, Tibet, and, and the Tang Dynasty, it's the Tibetan Empire that is the most relevant to the Ladakhis, because the Tibetan Empire is expanding aggressively west, right towards Ladakh, and ultimately will take over Ladakh, or at least enjoy a loose suzerain status over Ladakh. But it wasn't the Tibetans who brought Buddhism to Ladakh. You'd think that would have been the case. We think of Tibet, we think of Buddhism today. But uh, actually, Buddhism had been in Ladakh for centuries before it was established in Tibet. In fact, during the time of this, the Tibetan Empire, we're talking about the, the 700s here, the time when the Tibetan Empire extended its political suzerainty over Ladakh, Buddhism had not yet firmly established itself even in Tibet. Meanwhile, in Western Ladakh, and possibly even in Central Ladakh, Buddhism had been around since the first and second century AD, where it had penetrated from Kashmir. See, this was a pre-Tibetan Indian Buddhism. That Indian Buddhist tradition was buoyed up by the arrival of fleeing monks and nuns from India. They'd flee up into the hills uh, in the face of sort of a rising Hinduism, and then later, of course, a militant Islam. Meanwhile, in the Tibetan Empire, the first spreading was taking place, the phenomenon known as the first spreading, the first spreading of Buddhism, its chief actor being the famous monk Padmasambhava. But even with all of his efforts, Buddhism only established the most tentative hold on Tibet. It's very delicate. Uh, even with on and off patronage from the Yarlung kings, the Yarlung emperors, in fact, the fall of the Yarlung dynasty, the, the crumbling of the empire itself, is tied up in this whole story. The last of the great kings, his name was Long Dharma. He actually attempted to root out Buddhism and restore the old Bun practices, the old Bun cults. Uh, this made one Buddhist monk angry enough to assassinate Long Dharma, and that threw the empire into chaos, and you know uh, the Yarlung dynasty crumbled, or at least the, the empire crumbled. So even as Buddhism maintains only the smallest foothold in Tibet by the end of the first spreading. The first spreading we can date its end at 842 with the fall of the, the Tibetan Empire. In Ladakh, Buddhism is well established and has been for centuries. So why do I narrate this history? Well, it's because Lung Dharma's great-grandson, a guy named Nima Gon, so this is a scion of the old Yarlung dynasty. This is a scion of the old ruling house of the Tibetan Empire. He migrates, this is like 60, 70 years after the fall of the Tibetan Empire, he migrates to Western Tibet. He's got a whole group of old Tibetan aristocracy, these old noble families with him, and they set up a new kingdom, a new polity in Western Tibet. And over the next couple generations, this polity extends all the way into Ladakh. In fact, as far south as the Speedy Valley. Now, if you come to Ladakh today, you may notice that most Ladakhis look Tibetan. Okay, but that was not the case before this period. It's not until the late 900s and beyond that this Tibetanization happens. It's not until this new polity expands into what is today Ladakh. There's Tibetanization in terms of genetics, Tibetanization in terms of language, and of course Tibetanization in terms of religion.
today it's Tibetan stock that dominates Ladakh. And it was in Ladakh that the second spreading, the second spreading of Buddhism took place. We talked about the first spreading of Buddhism. The critical second spreading of Buddhism would be initiated right here in Ladakh. Uh, Nima Gon's great-grandson, a guy named Yeshe Old, he would organize an expedition to Kashmir and to other Buddhist centers. Kashmir was a great Buddhist center at the time. And in Northwest India, there were other great Buddhist centers at the time. And he sent a monk named Rinchen Tsangpo, by one scholar's estimate, the central figure of the second spreading. Rinchen Tsangpo, Lotsawa, the translator as he's known, he would go into Kashmir and other places, collect many texts, translate them into Tibetan, and establish many monasteries, by some counts over a hundred, including this one right here. This monastery, of course, here in the Indus Valley, the high Indus Valley, the Himalayas, is in ruins, but the walls still stand. The other great second spreading figure, vastly more well known outside of Ladakh than Rinchen Tsangpo, was a monk named Atisha, a very famous East Indian monk named Atisha. Now, Atisha had been invited many times by Yeshe Od to come and teach in Western Tibet and Ladakh. Yeshe Od passed away before Atisha heeded the call, but Atisha eventually did come. And he'd end up spending years in Ladakh and Tibet. In fact, he'd die in Tibet. Uh, and he brought with him Vajrayana Buddhism. Now this is important, even revolutionary for Tibetan culture, because Vajrayana Buddhism, generally speaking, this is the kind of Buddhism we would recognize today as Tibetan Buddhism. Okay, this is a form of Mahayana Buddhism characterized by you know, more esoteric and mystical elements, including some Tantra. Okay, Tibetan Buddhism. He didn't only bring Vajrayana Buddhism, though. He also established an order, the Kadampa. Important because this order was the forerunner of the great Gelugpa sect, the Yellow Hat sect of the Dalai Lamas later on. We see then that Ladakh looked first for religious guidance and inspiration to Kashmir and to Northwest India, way back in the first and second century AD. And then during the second spreading, once again to Kashmir and to Northwest India, then in the person of Atisha to East India for religious guidance and inspiration. So when did the Ladakhis and the Western Tibetans, for that matter, begin looking towards central Tibet for religious guidance and leadership? After all, this monastery here, within a couple centuries of its building, the Ladakhis are sending their novices for monastic training to central Tibet, not to India, not to Kashmir. So how did that happen? Well, part of it has to do with what I've already mentioned. There's a Hindu Renaissance going on in India that could turn militant. Militant Islam will begin making its appearance in India. And these raiders apparently had a, a special tendency to destroy all things Buddhist, to, to slaughter Buddhist monks and nuns, to destroy Buddhist monasteries, libraries, universities, temples, you name it. Now, throughout this period, and for centuries afterwards, the Ladakhi polity continued to be ruled by the same ruling family established by Nima Gon. Probably. I mean, there may have been usurpations. There are windows of time that are sort of mysteries. So who knows? But that's the tradition. The entire state was sort of broken up into little principalities, uh, each of which was sort of feudally connected to the Ladakhi kings. And around 1400, Muslim armies began to penetrate Ladakh from Kashmir, from Baltistan, from Central Asia. You know, this was a major threat. But at the same time as these raids were happening, developments within Buddhism were also happening. Uh, it would end up being much more culturally significant, at least in Central Ladakh. In particular, the establishment of the Yellow Hat sect or Gelugpa sect. This is the sect of the future Dalai Lamas. Its founder, Tsongkhapa, personally sent envoys into Ladakh, where monasteries were established. In fact, the first one to be established was established just a few miles from here, down across the Indus River, here up here in the high Indus Valley. And despite the success of some of these Muslim armies, in fact, one Muslim adventurer from Central Asia, uh, you know, occupied Shea, the summer capital, for several years, and, and at one point almost reached Lhasa. So these are highly successful raids, penetrating deep into the Tibetan world. But despite all that, it's the, it's the Buddhist orders, the Gelugpa and other orders from Tibet that are entrenching themselves in Ladakh. Uh, meanwhile, the Ladakhi kings are tolerant of all, but they're patronizing the Drugpa order. Under Tashi Namgyal, 
Ladakh was reunited after a period of political fragmentation. Tashinamgyal also expanded the borders of the state west and south, and he was able to hold the Muslim incursions off, at least temporarily. It's Tashinamgyal. And as a symbol of his deeds, he erected this temple. The Temple of the Guardian Deities. In the Temple of the Guardian Deities are housed the Lords of the Four Quarters. And according to tradition, Tashinamgyal would lay the bodies of his enemies underneath the Lords of the Four Quarters. And during his life, whatever power might have come from this temple seemed sufficient. But when he died, when Tashinamgyal died, any protective capacity of this temple seemed to fade away. Because in 1600, around 1600, a devastating incursion took place. Muslim armies from the west came in, ransacked, looted, burned, and destroyed monastery after monastery. In fact, most Buddhist structures today in Ladakh post-date these tragic events. Well, eventually the Muslim armies did withdraw, but not before wresting concessions out of the Namgyal monarchy. The most important of which, probably, was that the, the Namgyal king, the Buddhist king, must marry a Muslim princess. And not only that, but any son produced by this union must succeed to the Ladakhi throne. So this is clearly a ploy to witness or to put into effect conversion from the top. You know, but if so, it failed miserably because the people recognized the Muslim queen as an incarnation of white Tata. And the son that the union did indeed produce, his name was Senge Namgyal, ended up being a staunch Buddhist. Not only that, he's often lionized today as Ladakh's greatest king. I would not assess him that way, but that's how many, many view him. He was a great builder. He built monasteries and mani walls all over Ladakh together with his Tibetan teacher, Taksang Repa. He was a warrior king. He expanded the empire to its, you know, territorial zenith. Uh, he built the great nine-story palace that still looms over Lei to this day. So a lot of great and expensive accomplishments. He also battled the Mughals, and he battled the Mughals via Kashmir. And both sides would claim victory in this struggle. So we're not sure who won, probably the Mughals. In any case, Senge Namgyal, you know, livid at the Mughals, put in place, just a few years before his death, a ban on all trade west, all trade toward Kashmir, which of course was very foolish and devastating to the Ladakhi economy, which was based in large part on this trade. All that building of palaces, of monasteries, of mani walls, all that war, and especially the suicidal trade ban, these things devastated the Ladakhi economy. And it's no coincidence that it's around this time that things begin to unravel for the Ladakhi state. Uh, it's split into three after the death of Senge, Senge Namgyal. And the Mughals continue to make trouble in Ladakh, particularly under Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb always considered Ladakh part of his own territory. And it was Aurangzeb who forced the Namgyal king, Dildin Namgyal, to build Ladakh's, or at least central Ladakh's, first mosque in Leh, and to reopen those western trade routes. This was followed by a tragic, and in many ways pointless, conflict between Ladakh and Tibet. See, the Tibetans and the Bhutanese were in the midst of a conflict. Bhutan happened to be a Drukpa stronghold, as Ladakh was. Meanwhile, Tibet, of course, is a Gelugpa stronghold, the Gelugpa Dalai Lamas. And so when Tibet and Bhutan get, got in a little argument, the Ladakhi king tried to intervene on behalf of Bhutan, and the result was a Tibetan invasion. The Tibetan army was here for three years. It was a three-year siege, and the Ladakhis were so desperate that they called upon, well, who did they call upon for help? None other than their Muslim neighbors, the Kashmiris. Now, the Muslims did send an army. Uh, the Tibetans did pull back, and Ladakh was forced to make concessions to both sides. To the Tibetans, the Ladakhis agreed to a fixed border, sort of the border that exists today, uh, and to send regular 
caravan missions to Tibet, and the Tibetans would send caravan missions to Ladakh as well. Those are the concessions to the Tibetan side. But to the Kashmiri side, the concessions were a little more demanding. The Buddhist king of Ladakh would convert to Islam. That was the condition. Conversion to Islam. He would send his son to Kashmir to be raised a Muslim. And perhaps most critically of all, the Kashmiris demanded and received a monopoly on the purchasing of all pusham produced in western Tibet and Ladakh. These events really marked the end of the sovereignty of the Ladakhi state. I mean, at this point, Ladakh is beholden to not one, but two other states. Now, government spending on war, government spending on building projects, plus that suicidal trade ban, these had made Ladakh extremely weak, and more powerful states around it, uh, you know, had taken advantage, were ready to take advantage. Throw in another hundred years, we're talking about the 1700s here, another hundred years of you know, intrigue and factionalism and untimely deaths and assassinations and even mad kings. The royal house really in disarray. And Ladakh is ripe for the plucking. And so, in the early 19th century, the Sikh state snagged it. And then the British snagged it from the Sikh state and took all the Sikh state's territory. And then independent India took it or snagged it from Pakistan. Today, Ladakh, which had once been uh, you know, for almost a thousand years, an independent Buddhist kingdom is now a mere part of one state in the Republic of India.